everyone, thank you for joining. I had a really good um, amount of people trying to sign up for this. There was obviously something that people were interested in. Uh, I think competency is key in the industry and that's been made a big deal of going forward. So it's something that elements like this can help you with personally. Uh, I'd like to introduce everyone to Jo. She's the Member Experience Manager at the IFE. Uh, she's going to give you a kind of overview of the Engineering Council registration process uh, and also kind of give you a brief induction to the grades as well. Uh, as, as Joe and I had a little chat beforehand, a lot of people I think are due to get upgraded but haven't done it, whether it's uh, worry about the process, how long it takes or just don't have the time because the fire industry is very busy as it is. But it's something that I think is important for everyone to kind of keep on top of and kind of push themselves with. Uh, as per a normal clause, please bear in mind that um, the presentation is that of the host and nothing to do with the IFE Southern Branch. Uh, so we don't take any responsibility for that. But bear in mind that obviously Joe is with the IFE. I'm sure there won't be any problems with that anyway. Uh, so, OK, thank you, Joe. I'll pass it over to you. Uh, can I, sorry, actually, can I also just say, because you've got your microphones turned off, uh, if you have any questions, can you just put them in the chat section? Uh, with this, we have been made aware that pre during previous um, webinars that we've hosted, some people might not be able to use the chat function due to uh, an issue with Teams. If this is the case, just leave the room and come back in again, and apparently that should sort it out. But if you put any uh, comments in the chat section, any questions you have, and then I'll put them to Joe at the end. Thank you. Thanks very much for the intro, Dean. Um, so what I'm going to do, um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen with you. If somebody, perhaps Dean, can give me a thumbs up to make sure that you can see it. And then whilst I'm sharing my screen, I'm going to go camera off because I believe it just helps a little bit with my struggling bandwidth. Can you yeah, see I that? Can, yeah, I can see that. So I'm going to mute myself now. But um, yeah, I can see that all OK. That's great. Thanks, Dean. Okay, so um, yeah, as Dean mentioned, I'm uh, my name's Joe Ted. I'm the member experience manager um, at the Institution of Fire Engineers, and I've been in, invited this afternoon to talk to you about the Engineering Council. Um, so uh, I've also, because you are the um, IFE Southern Branch, I've also um, included a little bit about membership because um, as, as Dean alluded to, it might well be that it is time for you to start thinking about regrading your membership. I know it's easy to um, get membership and then remain in that same membership status uh, without regrading. So I want to talk to you about that because it's likely that that entire process has changed a lot since the first time you went through it. So without further ado, uh, we'll have a quick look then at uh, my IFE and what's in it for you, something I hope that you're familiar with already. Uh, we'll have a look at regrading your IFE uh, membership. Uh, we'll talk in depth about Engineering Council. And lastly, I will show you who the team of people are at the other end of the phone and the email to help you. So in terms of my IFE, like I said, I hope you're all familiar with this. This is the area of the website, which is um, a portal that you need to log into. Um, if you have forgotten your login, then you can contact um, IFE HQ, who will be able to give you a reminder of your username so that that will allow you to reset your password. Um, Incidentally as well, if you do try to log in and your the login that you're sure is your login is not working, be aware that the logins are case sensitive. So the usernames are case sensitive as well. Uh, if you're not too familiar with my IFE, uh, what the um, contents of that is the big things are the CPD hub where we have collated various elements of CPD. Um, there are links to resources, there are videos, there are articles from other websites and they are sent to us by branches around the world. Um, we've got all of our conference content on there as well, but it's all the point is that it's all in one handy place for you to access. The other thing that is included in my IFE is something called My Career Path. Every single member of the IFE has access to My Career Path. And uh, My Career Path is an online CPD tracking facility. 
I know that in the fire industry, it's it's really prevalent that you keep up with your CPD. Uh, certainly when we go on to talk about engineering council registration, uh, you'll appreciate that it's a big uh, it's a big issue there as well. Um, so it's useful to have a tracking facility that's kept online. It's mobile friendly also. So if you are out at a seminar, you can actually log it on your My Career Path CPD log there and then. You've also got access to all of the IFE special interest groups. Um, you can have a read about more details on, on what they uh, entail and also there are contact details on there should you wish to become involved in any of those. Uh, and there are um, also our research reports. So the um, current um, research reports that the IFE are involved in and you can access your IFP journal online um, you can also opt into receiving it online rather than receiving a hard copy. Uh, I've just seen someone saying they can't hear anything. Can I just check that the majority, everybody else can? I can hear you fine. Um, I think maybe it's just another issue that someone has. If Paul, if you just log out and log back in again, um, let me know. OK, all right. Thank you. Thank you for confirming. Uh, so that's my IFE. Um, I would strongly suggest that if you don't, um, if you don't already use that facility, that you log into it and, and have a good look around. Um, that's also the place that you can regrade your membership as well. Uh, uh, you can see in the middle of the screen there, there's start an application which you can use uh, to to re regrade your membership. Um, OK, so in terms of memberships then, oh, and probably this is a good stage to mention as well, that when a lot of you applied the first time around, it's likely that, in fact, if it was before December 2019, you will have applied using a paper application form and you will either have scanned it in and emailed it to us uh, or you will have stuck it in an envelope and put it in the post to us. We don't use paper application forms anymore. All of the application process is online. And I know that the application uh, process from you submitting your application to you receiving your result used to be around on average 40, 46 days for you to get your result. Nowadays, it takes 13 days from you submitting your application to you getting your result on average. So it's a vastly different process. So please don't be put off if, if that was your previous experience. So in terms of the membership grades then, um, you're probably all familiar with these, so I, I don't want to go over old ground with you. But just as a reminder, um, these are the membership grades along with their post nominals that they afford. Each of the membership grades carries its own requirements and each requirement for experience is indicative, but it really depends on the experience that you've gained uh, in your career so far. Uh, dependent on your fire, fire engineering related qualification, um, it might well be that you're eligible to regrade your membership. And if you're at all unsure on where you should be as opposed to where you are now, then please do get in touch with us. Um, the member services team are there to support you through the process. And ultimately, we want everybody to be able to regrade their membership to the very best level for them. Uh, their email address is on the website, of course, but um, just so that you've got it, it's membership at ife.org.uk. <clears throat> so, um, in terms of professional registration then, if you've already got IFE membership and you're looking for professional registration, or in fact, if you don't have IFE membership and you're looking to um, become professionally registered, um, and that is recognition through membership of a relevant um, professional engineering institution, and it recognises that an individual's competence has been assessed 
and that they've attained the standard required for admission to the National Register at the appropriate level. And we will talk about those levels also. The register is open to any competent practicing engineer or technician with different levels and pathways to registration available. And the categories have been developed to provide a progressive registration structure. So the IFE is licensed by the Engineering Council to recommend fire professionals for registration, as you might expect. And the registration titles that we offer are EngTech, Engineering Technician. Um, engineering technicians use engineering solutions to solve problems and they perform engineering activities. iEng, or Incorporated Engineer. Uh, incorporated engineers maintain engineering solutions and they supervise engineering activities. and CENG, Chartered Engineer. Chartered engineers develop engineering solutions and they manage engineering activities. So with each of the uh, registration levels um, affords a um, membership um, grade as well. So Chartered Engineer would get you MI Fiery, so member grade membership of the IFE. Incorporated Engineer would get you member grade also. And Engineering Technician would get you either GI Fiery or TI Fiery. And which one of those it affords depends on the way your route to registration, so the way that you apply to become registered. And I will talk about that in more detail in a moment. You can see on there as well, there are two other levels that have appeared on the screen. So we've got interim CNG and interim ING. And both of those afford the member grade AI Fiery, so associate grade membership. Uh, interim CNG and interim ING are for people who have the engineering qualification at the required level, but who don't yet have any industry experience or rather enough industry experience. Each registration application is considered based on academic qualifications, initial professional development or professional review report, a professional review interview, and a commitment to CPD. So this document is called the UK spec and the Engineering Council sets and maintains UK standards for professional engineering competence. That's what the UK spec is. Just excuse me. Sorry about that. Uh, this is a key document for professional registration. So the UK standard for professional engineering competence, the UK spec, describes the value of becoming registered in each of the three registration sections. It describes the requirements that have to be met in order to gain registration and gives examples of ways of doing this. Uh, UK spec should enable individuals and employers uh, to find out whether they or their staff can meet the requirements and explains the steps necessary to achieve professional registration with the Engineering Council. So the last section of this document is really useful because it compares all three levels of registration against each competence. So those A to E competences that you see on the screen there, um, each of them are compared for engineering technician incorporated engineer and chartered engineer. And then on top of this um, Engineering Council UK spec are the IFE's own fire engineering specific IPD objectives, which are essentially the UK spec competencies 
but put into a fire engineering context. So who does the reviewing? You've submitted an application uh, and then it's going to be reviewed uh, on a, a number of at a number of stages through the process. Who does that reviewing? It's probably useful to start here. Sorry, I'm being distracted by questions, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's probably useful to start here. So this shows how IFERG, and that's the IFE Registrant, Registrants Group Committee, um, is represented at IFE board level, um, where James Lane is the board trustee holding the IFERG portfo portfolio. Um, so once your application is passed the initial sense checking by the team at IFE HQ, applications are reviewed by a group of dedicated volunteers. Uh, the process is overseen by the IFERG membership committee and the committee meets every two months to progress applications. Uh, we meet virtually nowadays where we used to meet in person. Um, and the committee includes representation, uh, representation from Hong Kong and also Australia. So one of the four elements then um, of the application is academic requirements. So for EngTech, you would be looking at an approved level three or above qualification or equivalent. For IENG, an accredited BENG honours or equivalent. And for CENG, an accredited MENG honours, accredited BENG honours plus accredited MSc or equivalent. Uh, you can use the Engineering Council's website to do a course check. Uh, here is the website. Um, I can send this on to Dean perhaps so that he can circulate it or put it put the link near to the video once it's published. Um, and you can have a look to see whether or not your course is accredited by the Engineering Council. Be aware that when you're using this co uh, course search, it's really important that when you find what you think is your course, check the course title on the Engineering Council website. <clears throat> make sure it's exactly the same course. Um, any slight variation in course title usually means that it's not the same course. And the other thing to note is the year of the course that is listed on the Engineering Council's website to make sure that you're looking at the uh, course in a year that you've actually taken it. Um, don't worry if you don't hold an accredited qualification. There are other ways to meet the academic requirement. Um, you might need to provide more information about your qualification, which will help our individual route panel to assess it. Uh, they might decide that your qualifications are of equivalence uh, to the required standard or that you need to submit a technical report to top up the academic side of your application. A technical report is a bit like a technical journal article of around 10,000 words, so it's not a small thing to do, but it can be a valid way to meet the academic requirements. So as you can see here, there are lots of options available. Um, T uh, typical individual route applications could be combinations listed under point two here. Uh, and a standard route application would be where you have an accredited degree, um, an MEng post 1999 or BEng honours plus an accredited masters. And the individual route, and I'm, I'm not going to read through them because you can see them there, but for example, could be a relevant degree seven years experience and submission of a technical report, or it could also be no qualifications at all, but 15 years experience and a technical report written to the required standard. I will talk about that in a, in a little bit as well. Um, I touched on interim C engine I end registration earlier on. Um, 
the interim registrations prove that you meet the academic requirement for CNG or ING and they bank your qualification with the Engineering Council. Your qualification doesn't need to be in fire engineering. Any accredited engineering degree or degrees are accepted um, and they can also be accredited by any engineering council institution. Fully accredited degrees are called standard route, so it's very uh, quick and easy application for interim registration where you've got a standard route application, so an accredited qualification. And um, successful uh, interim CNG or IN registration also grants AI Fiery, so associate membership of the IFE. If you've got qualifications uh, that you think are relevant or you've checked already and they are accredited, then you can download application forms from our website and our website is ife.org.uk. However, if you haven't got an accredited degree, you can also submit an application for interim CNG or ING to get your qualifications assessed and that way you know where you stand and you know where you, you will stand in the future when you go for your full ING or CNG registration. Individual route panel assessors will decide whether your qualifications are of equivalence to the required standard um, we will need your course transcript or, or list of modules plus your dissertation abstract to submit to that individual route panel so they've got a good idea of what the qualification entailed. If the qualification after being assessed by the individual route panel is deemed not of equivalence, there are still ways forward. You won't be able to apply for interim CNG or IND registration, but you could consider applying now for your associate membership um, as a lower level of academic requirements um, are needed for that. Uh, and then thinking about the future, uh, perhaps you might want to look into further qualifications or you could consider the technical report route option at full CNG or IND application stage. Um, and uh, as I've mentioned, that, that technical report tops up the academic difference between the qualifications you've got and what's required. So thinking about that technical report then. Uh, the first thing that to do is to submit an application as normal. Then once it's been reviewed and it's been deemed necessary that you need to write a technical report, it goes through three stages. So uh, submission of a synopsis of your technical report. Uh, then you would submit your full technical report. Uh, and then you would attend a technical report interview where it will be a professional discussion between you and two or three assessors um, uh, to talk about um, the report that you've written. Your technical report will need to demonstrate math, fire science and engineering knowledge and understanding from first principles to MEng honours level for CNG registration and to BEng honours level for ING. A technical report will be around 6,000 to 10,000 words. It's usually based on an investigation or project on some aspect of fire engineering in which the writer has been personally involved. <clears throat> the technical report is not intended to be a demonstration of professional competence. Uh, that's what the professional review report is for. So this is the report that demonstrates um, the knowledge and understanding in lieu of a qualification.
Um, you'll have to submit a 10 page professional review report with approximately four or five career episodes cross referenced against those A to E competencies from the UK spec for CNG. Uh, those competencies are listed in the UK spec document, which is available on the Engineering Council's website. And I would always suggest that you get the, your copy from there because it means that you're looking at the latest version. The IFE fire engineering specific competencies on CNG and ING um, are on our website page called and they're labelled IPD competencies. Um, they are listed both under CNG and ING. <clears throat> You'll need to make sure that you familiarise yourself uh, with the required competencies. Plan your projects and experience and exposure to fill in and fill in any gaps where you've got a gap against a particular competence. We've also got extensive guidance on how to write a good uh, professional review report, and that's kept on our CNG web page. And you'll need to undertake and log your CPD. So um, the format of a professional review report. Um, definitely have a look at how to write a good professional review report from that CNG page of our website. A professional review report should clearly demonstrate how you've achieved each IPD objective for CNG or ING registration. You should provide clear and specific evidence in the form of a series of career episodes. Evidence will not be inferred and statements of competence do not constitute evidence. So when you're writing the report, you need to make sure that uh, if you put yourself in the reviewer's shoes as somebody who has never met you before, has never heard about your work, doesn't know anybody that you know, from your report, um, can they pick out the competencies that are needed? Um, IPD objectives should be cross referenced in the right hand margin of your report adjacent to the relevant statement so that the reviewers can easily identify where you have um, satisfied uh, competence. And your PRR content uh, should be limited to, to that required to evidence achievement of IPD objectives. If it's not relevant and it's not demonstrating a competence, then it shouldn't be included in your PRR. And I don't wish to be pointed, um, however, it is a good tip. Background information, organisational charts, reports, your CV, anything submitted in addition to your PRR won't be sent to the reviewers. They won't see that. It's just the, the elements of the application that will be sent. Your PRR shouldn't be less than 3,000 words and it shouldn't go over 6,000 words. It usually works out to be around 10 A4 size, but you know, it depends on font size, etc. So ideally stick within the word count. Um, relevant pictures and diagrams can be included. Um, as I mentioned before, su any supplementary documents won't be considered or sent to the reviewers. Quality, clarity, relevance and succinctness of the report will also form part of the review and that falls under objective D1. There is no upper or lower limit to the number of career episodes that you use, but around four to six is considered optimum because that should allow both breadth and depth of evidence in your report. Uh, career episodes don't um, have to all be project specific. Um, just a couple of notes on this one. You don't need to check the word count, but we know from experience that any less than 3000 words usually has insufficient evidence and um, 5000 should be adequate to provide sufficient. 
Uh, if it's very obviously too short or too long, it won't make it past the first headquarters checks um, and be sent out for review. Um, it will come back to you. Um, and again, thinking about the number of career episodes, too few will probably not show enough evidence and too many uh, won't um, uh, won't go into enough detail. Hence the four to six episodes being being the optimum there. Uh, it is possible to have career episodes that relate to a specific experience, uh, perhaps authorship of a guidance document, delivering a training program, a relevant sabbatical or setting up an IFE branch company or trade body. So that's the PRR. On to CPD. Um, there is specific Engineering Council CPD guidance that's available on the Engineering Council website. Uh, your CPD is checked at application and at interview stage. I talked about my career path as part of the My IFE um, login, uh, the registration that you all have as members. Um, it's available, um, as I said, on desktop version and mobile version, uh, which makes it really convenient to use. And it is mandatory for all registrants um, to keep CPD logs and to undertake CPD. Um, annual random sampling um, is done with all of our um, engineering council registrants. So it, it could be you that's picked to, to submit your CPD log. promise to introduce you to the team. So these are the team who are dealing with your inquiries and helping you through your application process. Um, between us, we've got 20 years experience helping individuals to get their membership and professional registration. Uh, so we would hope then that we can answer all of your questions. And if you wanted to continue on to engineering council registration, I would suggest if you have a fire engineering related qualification, um, then first of all, you can get your uh, IFE membership. If it's not fire related, you can join as an affiliate. Uh, then visit the engineering, uh, sorry, ife.org.uk forward slash engineering hyphen council. Um, the engineering council pages of our website for more detail on registration, application forms, all of the guidance documents are there as well. Um, there is lots of help and advice on hand. Uh, we obviously the team are, are dedicated to engineering council registration. Um, uh, and inquiries can be sent to either of these email addresses. And one last thing that I would say just before um, I hand over for any questions is please do um, read the guidance that is available on, on our website. We do we do um, we do receive feedback from reviewers sometimes where the feedback is this candidate, this applicant has not read the guidance. So if you don't read the guidance, it, it is apparently very obvious. So my first tip, big tip would be to read the guidance on, that's on there. That's me. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. Does anybody have any questions for me? I can see the chat's been going while I've been talking. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I've been writing down some questions, so if it's okay, I'll, I'll point these to you now. And if anyone else has got any more questions, please keep filling them out and uh, we'll come to them as soon as possible. Uh, so to begin with, uh, it's a question I've always thought, wondered, actually. Um, what kind of percentage of people go for the technical route and have to do the technical report side of things? Because I think a lot of people can be quite daunted by actually the application form and the process anyway, yet alone having to do um, a technical report with it. So I've always wondered what kind of ratio is that? Yeah, it's a really good question. And off the top of my head, I can't tell you what percentage. However, I can tell you that it's not it's not common, I would say. The technical report route is not common. Yeah, we understood that. Uh, OK, so another question I got. I engine CNG, um gets you to the MI fire level. 
Uh, but does it work the other way around? So I imagine probably Knox is going to be meeting engineering um, criteria. Uh, so I think what they're asking is essentially if you've got the MI fire grading, does that help with reaching ING level, for instance? No, you're absolutely right. There are different requirements. So we need to see a demonstration of the um, A to E competencies in the UK spec for the Engineering Council registration, and they're different to the IPD report that you submit as a member, grade member. Thank you. Um, the CNG application, someone's just asked, uh, is the process online or still just on paper? I think mm. you've spoken about a few times, everything been on paper being moved online. Uh, the, they are digital forms, so you can fill them out on screen and you can submit them back to us. In fact, you can only submit them back to us by um, email. You don't need to print them out anymore and have them signed or, or countersigned um, by anybody else. Uh, so it's digital. I wouldn't call it online yet. Perfect, thank you. Uh, probably something that I've come across as well. I know you mentioned about uh, timescales for the process, how long it lasts. It seemed to me personally the grading of the uh, membership levels was a lot quicker than the engineering council process. Uh, so someone's asked, um, well, they've potentially heard rumours of it being long delays with uh, the engineering side. Is, is this the case or is it still quite a quick process compared to what it used to be? Um, it's quicker than it used to be. We are in the process at the moment of implementing some improvements uh, internally, which will make it quicker again. It definitely takes longer than membership. And the reason for that is because um, all of the, the peer reviewing that goes on, the interviews that happen, they're all done by volunteers of the IFE. And so that volunteer time is like, gold dust I suppose. Um, people give up their time to review the professional review reports and to attend interviews. Um, whereas the membership applications, um, the most complicated would be the member and fellow grades where it might take up to an hour to review those. With the engineering council applications it takes longer and I mean anywhere from sort of two plus hours to review those reports. So because of that, and because of the volume that we receive, it's a longer process. Um, however, the other thing that slows things down is where an application is submitted and rejected before it actually leaves IFE HQ. So if the team, the member services team at IFE HQ uh, find that there is an element of the application missing, then it will be sent back to the applicant for that application to be completed. Then once we've received it back, then we'll try again to get it through the process. Um, conservatively, I would say, uh, well, sorry, at the outside, if you submit any, everything perfectly in the beginning, then I would say uh, six months. Um, uh, but it can take longer than that. It depends on what you submit. It depends as well if you're going through the standard route, then the process is simpler in that it doesn't need to go to the individual route panel. If you're going through the individual route, then it needs to pass through an individual route panel before it then goes to IFERG uh, and then and then sent out to review again. Um, is it maybe? useful if I just explain the process and what happens. I, I don't want to frighten everybody or confuse everyone because the process is our responsibility. It, it's your responsibility to submit the application. But do you think that might be useful, Dean? Yeah, definitely. That's OK. I mean, for the process itself, just a quick question on that as well. You talk about time scales of approximately six months. Yes. Is that for every single level? Or will, uh, say, Eng Tech be a lot quicker than a CNG application? Eng tech should be quicker, but I would say at the outside six months, again, because of that backwards and forwards initially, if not everything is submitted, then it's going to be batted back. Yeah, yeah perfect. So it, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind explaining a little bit, that'd be great. Okay, so like I say, I, I don't want this to be an off-putting or scary thing, but just so that you can appreciate the process. An application is submitted, and then the member services team in the office 
are literally going through a checklist of items to make sure that everything is included in the application. If it's not, then it, the application is sent back out to the applicant with a request for whatever information is missing. If everything is included, then it will move on to the next stage, which will be uh, if it's a standard route, it will be out for um, peer review. So we'll have a number of volunteer reviewers reading through the application um, to check suitability. And then off the back of that, they will make a recommendation. Uh, and then that recommendation is put in front of the panel for the panel to then ratify that decision. And if it's engineering technician, you'll be issued with your result unless you're required to do an interview. But that's not um, a necessarily a thing for engineering technician um, on, only applications that aren't uh, complete enough or, or in depth enough will be required to have an interview just to so that the um, panel can get the additional info that they need, but in a face to face situation. Um, and after it's come out of the panel, if it's a CNG or ING application, uh, then you'll be invited for interview. The results of the interview will then go in front of the panel to be ratified again uh, because we're checking for uh, fairness and um, uh, quality of um, the interviewing. Uh, and then you'll be given your result. So there's quite a bit of backwards and forwards through the process and there's a lot of checking that happens. But this is something that the Engineering Council stipulate that we do to make sure that only people who should be registered with the Engineering Council are registered. Uh, I hope that helps to explain why there is such a process behind it. Yeah, that definitely helps. And I think the advantage of that, whilst it is a long process and there's lots to it, um, one advantage that springs to mind for me is if you get through part of the process, but you're not quite there, at least it's not a fail, good luck, start again from the beginning. At least it's a helping process to actually kind of get you through it. Absolutely. And if you do, you know, if there is any stage of that, that uh, let's say the initial reviewers have looked at your report and um, and they've got some suggestions, though that suggestion will again go to the panel to make sure that the panel agree with it because they're the most experienced ones. Uh, and then we will come back to you with what we call a revise and resubmit um, communication. So we'll be saying it hasn't hit the mark on this occasion. However, the panel have suggested that you do this and then resubmit it so that hopefully you'll hit the mark on the next round. So it's yes, yeah, not a flat no. Perfect. Yeah, that definitely makes it worthwhile. Uh, I think again, along the same time scale, someone's asked uh, once the committee has met, how long should we expect to wait to hear the outcome? I think partly from my experience, I imagine they're probably asking the question because if you ask for a time scale to the IFE, they might tell you the committee is meeting on a date and you'll hear some point after that. Uh, so they're probably along feeding along the lines of how long to expect at that point. Yeah. It's a really good question. I'm afraid it's not one that I'm willing to commit an answer to. I can tell you again, I can explain what the process is after the meeting. So we would always shy away from um, uh, publicising any committee meeting dates because uh, from experience that mean that just leads to uh, hundreds of phone calls and emails from people saying, I know that they met at two o'clock today, what's happening? And of course that slows everything down because the people who are answering those phone calls and emails are the same people who are processing your application. So I try and steer away from that. Um, what happens after the meeting? Uh, we have very formal notes. Again, it's part of the engineering council auditing that happens um, um, on an annual basis. That's how we have and, and maintain our engineering council license. Um, so the the formal notes are written up by the admin team, the member services team, and then those notes have to go back to the chair of the panel and the chair of the panel has to sign them off. Within those notes are the results of everybody's application who's been in front of that panel. So until those notes are signed off by the volunteer chair of the panel, we can't communicate the results with anyone in case we've got something wrong on them. So that's really 
what slows us down. As soon as the notes are signed off, then the team are on it, um, get, get, getting the results out to everyone. Uh, so how long is that? There's only so much you can um, badger a volunteer because, you know, they are giving up their time. And, and, and I know that a lot of you here today will be volunteers either for us or for other PEIs, perhaps, and, and appreciate that, you know, giving up your time is it's a it's a tough thing to do and you're all busy. So I hope that helps. I think exactly that is thinking on something that is really volunteer based. Obviously, it's a long process anyway, but relying on volunteers to get through that, you've got some sort of understanding of how it's going to be a long period. But um, especially with things like CNG, it'd be worth it in the end. Yeah, uh, but, but like I said, there are there are things that we are doing internally to speed it up that that don't affect the volunteers. So, um, the, but the other bits, you know, we can speed up. So. So just talking with Mark on mute. Um, so someone has asked uh, whether EU accredited degrees are accepted um, or do they need to be British degrees? No, they don't need to be British de British degrees. Easy for me to say. Um, if you visit the Engineering Council website, you can see whether or not a degree is listed on there. You can also see whether or not a degree is listed under the Washington and or Sydney Accords. Uh, and there is also a site called Fiani, and I'm gonna F-E-A-N-I. And there are accredited degrees listed on that site also. And um, if you're unsure, the best bet is to email the member services team who will be able to tell you far better than I whether or not your degree is accredited. Perfect, thanks Joe. Uh, Kyle's got a question that's actually kind of relevant to me as well, so selfishly I'm going to ask her this one. Um, if you've got a degree that's not relevant, so a BSc honours degree in something completely different, uh, but you're doing an MSc or MEng in a relevant degree, so in my case personally I'm talking about I did a completely relevant degree but I'm now doing a fire engineering master's but the route that ends up with an MN rather than the MSc, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, do you, does that firstly make a difference? Because obviously to get the MN, you need to do the five years at UCLan, uh, which is essentially the degree first with the masters afterwards compared to the masters on its own, which is the MSc. Firstly, can I throw that out there just to say, does that make a difference at all in the process? Um, it, it depends on what you've done. If it's an, uh, it won't be an integrated MEng, will it? Um, but there are qualifications that are listed um, as accredited with the Engineering Council. And if you have a little look at your your particular course on the Engineering Council website, it might say for the BSc section, for example, it might say accredited but requires further learning. And then when you look at the um, the MSc section of it, it might say accredited is further learning. So when you put the two together, you have an accredited qualification on their own. They might not do anything. Um, and it's, it really is dependent on which qualifications you've got. But again, the girls in the office are adept at this. So so please get in touch with them. Perfect. And then he, he kind of follows it on with saying, um, obviously, about accredited uh, qualification, but then will it need to be a technical report following on from that? But again, that's probably dependent on exactly what you're saying and whether it's counted. He, he's talking about if you get a degree in something that's not relevant and then get a master's in fire engineering, is that enough or do you need to follow it on with a technical report to kind of make up for an irrelevant degree as such? Right, so again, first port of call is check to see whether or not combined they are accredited. And if they're not, then that's when it will go to this individual route panel. So this panel is looking for the level of learning that is equivalent to getting either an MNG honours or a BNG honours, um, dependent whether you're going for ING or CNG. If they can see from the modules and the abstracts from, from your course, that it is of equivalence, then you won't need to do the technical report. You can carry on because you've got that equivalent learning. Um, so yeah, I can't answer that. That's where we need the the, the peer reviewers again um, 
and they will determine whether or not it, it's equivalent. I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, Andrew has asked a question, said he's recently been subject to a CPD review and he just wants to know if you get feedback following that or whether it's just a response. Uh, no, that, do you know, I would expect you get feedback even if it's just a confirmation that thank you very much, we've submitted it to the panel. You certainly get feedback if there is no response from you. Um, but yeah, uh, at least a confirmation. Thank you. We've submitted it to to the panel for review. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. So just reading through. Um, so Jonathan's asked, uh, the easiest option appears to be to get the degree and then apply for the grade. Uh, to this end, I assume that the searching on the skills course search would give you a good steer on what qualification degree to go and get. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Just bear in mind, though, those years of the qualification. Uh, don't don't go on there and pick up a qualification that's no longer run anywhere, or rather that that whose accreditation ran out in 2015 and they still run the course now. So just bear that in mind. Um, and yes, you can do it that way round if if you feel like you need to top up your qualifications and that you don't have the, the right equivalents at the moment. Yeah. And a couple of interesting questions, actually. So they were talking about referees um, to support your application. So if you don't have access to two chartered engineers uh, to act as referees, is this a problem? Um, y y yes, you do need um, you need your referees need to be the same level that you're looking to register at, don't they? So uh, you would need, yeah, you would need um, referees to chartered engineers, for example, if you're going with CNG. Um, I think probably a good tip for this one is to ask around uh, if you're uh, you know, if you're studying at the moment, say you, Dean, I can tell you the names of two chartered engineers that you have access to um, because I know where you're at uni. Uh, um, other people, the people that they work with, I think sometimes people don't talk about registration that they've got. They just keep it on the on the a little bit quiet. And, and when you start to talk to people, you find out that actually you, you probably do know two chartered engineers. I think that's just one of those things where there's not many chartered engineers around. Um, get networking. Uh, there's always a good way to meet people, especially through branches of the IFE. And you probably do actually know more than you think you do. You just haven't really kind of introduced yourself in that way where someone would probably kind of be comfortable to ask, can you be a referee for me? So in the fire industry, everyone knows everyone. It's a very small industry and everyone seems to be in general pretty pretty warm and good to speak to about helping each other. So I'm sure you can start networking and use opportunities like I said, like the branches, um, then you know, I'm sure you can find those referees. Uh, OK, so. Sorry, Joe, bear with me, just reading through some more. That's OK, don't worry, it gives me a chance to have a drink. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I don't think this is something that you could answer, but he's, uh, Andrew's putting this out there. Would it be better to price the application for the cost of the process rather than relying on volunteers? So I imagine what he's saying is increasing the price to pay someone to essentially do this as a job. Um, again, it's probably not a question for you rather than saying... Well, uh, I mean, it's something that I have considered um, as the member experience manager, the clues in the title, I'm all about your experience as an applicant and member being the best it possibly can be. So I have considered it. However, as soon as you employ somebody, they become very quickly um, out of date, to be harsh. They, they're not current anymore. They're not an actual fire engineer working in fire engineering on a day to day basis living it uh, but the volunteers are so 
and this is my opinion, not the opinion of the whole IFE, and I can't say that it's not going to change in the future. But for me, it's better to use volunteers. I do appreciate I appreciate the suggestion, thanks, but it has been considered. Got a question from Veronica, uh, Veronica, which I'm very happy to see that she's actually made a member's grade after reading her application. It was pretty impressive, so there was no way that she wasn't going to get it. Mm -hmm. uh, but she asked the question, say, is it okay to use uh, project descriptions from your member application in your CNG application? My understanding, they're two completely different processes, so you can use both. It's, it's not going to be an issue if you want to kind of, yeah, use one application for the other, essentially. Yeah. That, that's not a problem. Make sure they're relevant by all means. Perfect. And she's also asked, uh, do you require certificates as proof of course attendance for any CP log training listed within your CP log? Okay. Really good question. And actually it leads on to a really good tip about CPD. No, you don't require certificates as proof of course attendance. You might be asked for them. Um, you know kind of a checking mechanism that we have but what the panels are more interested in are your learning outcomes because that will be better proof than any certificate uh, you could get a certificate for a CPD event and have slept the entire way through it but but you needed to have been awake and, and present to to provide the learning outcomes Perfect. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Ashley, I think you did send me a message, but I couldn't see it pop up. So I don't know if you've got a question that you can put in the chat if you see this. Um, so I can ask that. Uh, in the meantime, Tim, uh, don't give up. It could be terrifying the process, but it's not time to learn golf. Uh, stick with it. It's well worth it, I'm sure. <laughs> um, outside of that, I think that's all the questions. So. Like I said, Ashley, I can't see where your question came through, but I can ask Ossie Joe at a separate time and then get back to you with whatever that question was. Um, but I think you probably know Joe, Ashley, you probably know each other at some point anyway. I think um, we've spoken. <laughs> but thank you for that. Um, this is being recorded, so we will post this on to the Southern Branch website. Um, hopefully you're all aware of that anyway from previous webinars, but if not, it's just ife7.co.uk. Uh, Joe, thank you very much for doing this. I know you filled in kind of short notice anyway, but you came across really well and I've really appreciated it. It's, it's a process that I'm looking to go through. Uh, so on a selfish level, I've really enjoyed it and it's made a lot of difference to me. Uh, and it's something like I said, aim for competence. This is a good way of showing that uh, and competency in the industry is obviously the key topic since all the past things that have happened. So it's going to be very relevant and very important. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much, Joe. Thanks for inviting me. Cheers, Cheers. everyone. Bye-bye.